Our Bible reading this morning is from the book of Micah, chapter 6, and we're reading the whole thing. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Boah, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Listen, the Lord is calling to the city, and to fear your name is wisdom. Heed the rod and the one who appointed it. Am I still to forget your ill-gotten treasures, you wicked house, in the short of Epaph, which is accursed? Shall I acquit someone with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? Your rich people are violent, your inhabitants are liars, and their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore, I have become to destroy you, to ruin you because of your sins. You will eat but not be satisfied. Your stomach will still be empty. You will store up but save nothing, because what you save I will give to the sword. You will plant but not harvest. You will press olives but not use the oil. You will crush grapes but not drink the wine. You have observed the statutes of Omri and the practices of Ahab's house. You have followed their traditions. Therefore, I will give you over to ruin and your peoples to derision. You will bear the scorn of the nations. Let's pray again as we come to look at chapter 6 of Micah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that Micah addressed your people of old and uh, the way that we see your plans for him, uh, spoken through him, come to realisation in Jesus. We pray that as we see his words uh, about what you require for the Israelites, that we'll think about what you require of us and seek to live in the light of that. For Jesus' sake, amen. Years ago, I helped my uh, older daughter buy a second-hand car from a dealer. We took it for a drive. It all went well. We got back to the dealer's office to then negotiate the price. We arrived at a figure that we were all happy with, uh, so we shook hands. Deal done, so I thought. I was then presented with a whole lot of paperwork to sign, with threats of big penalties if I didn't come up with the money. I thought, didn't I just say that I was going to pay? Didn't we just shake on it? Didn't we have a deal? Is my word worth nothing? I guess not. I guess many people had agreed and then backed out, not come up with the money that they'd agreed to pay. If I wanted the car, I had to sign on the dotted line. I had to make myself legally liable, which I did. (laughs) Paid the money and thankfully my daughter has had no problems with the car since. Um, Israel had done a deal with God at Mount Sinai. They'd given verbal assent. They'd effectively shaken on it. But then they went back on the deal. They didn't keep their words. In chapter 6 of Micah, God calls the prophet Micah effectively to present what seems to be a lawsuit. He's taking Israel to court for the way that they reneged on the deal that they had with God. And they were liable. Let's read verse 1 and 2 again. Listen to what the Lord says. 
Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He's lodging a charge against Israel. Here, the mountains and the hills are personified. They're called in as witnesses in the Lord's case against his people. Normally, a legal case was held in Israel by the, at, the, at, the, at the city gates by the city's elders or by the Levitical priests at the temple. But here, God's case against his people Israel is heard by their environment. That's because, in a sense, I think the mountains and the hills have effectively witnessed Israel's behavior. Furthermore, the mountains and the hills, they have a good vantage point. They're elevated. They're able to see down what has happened in their cities. The everlasting foundations of the earth have a long history and they're reliable witnesses in this case against his people. What's interesting in this case that God's bringing against Israel is that normally once you've summoned the witnesses, you would then sit out the sins or the crimes that have been committed. But in this lawsuit, in chapter 6, there's no listing of Israel's sins. But we've seen plenty of them, haven't we, to this point in the book. Uh, Micah refers to their sins of idolatry, prostitution, plotting evil, seizing property, theft, mistreating women and children, violence, corruption. There's no shortage of sins that have been evident. All of those things were contrary to the deal that God had made with his people at Sinai, things they'd agreed not to do. But rather than mention Israel's sins, in this trial, God seems to put himself on trial. He seems to flip the whole proceedings. It's not what you'd expect. Verse 3, My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. As he flips the scene from what you'd expect, he's actually putting the spotlight of interrogation back onto the Israelites and points to, I think, something that's much more fundamental than just the, the sins that they've been committing. What he's doing, he's actually highlighting their heart attitude. It's out of the overflow of their hearts that their mouths speak, that they commit the sins that they do. What God is doing in this court case is focusing on his people's relationship with him and his, their attitude to him, which is the real problem, the real source. God asks, how have I burdened you? The question implies that the people have complained about God's treatment of them. Either they thought that God was unfair or that his requirements in the covenant in the deal that they'd done, were too hard, too restrictive. In the court case, the people aren't said to reply to that question, are they? I mean, what could they say? But God answers his own question in the trial by reminding them of the many, many good things that he's done for them. Effectively saying to them, you have no grounds for complaint. And certainly no grounds for backing out of the deal that we had. In verse 4, God says, I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. There's another little word play there. The brought you up in the Hebrew it sounds like the very words I burdened you. Have I burdened you? I brought you up. God's salvation of his people out of Egypt was the basis of the deal. God saved them by his grace. That redemption was costly. It cost God to save them. But not only did God save them out of their captivity, he also sent human leaders to lead them towards the promised land. In verse, the second half of verse 4, he reminds them, I sent Moses to lead you and also Aaron and Miriam. Moses was the great leader, wasn't he? And also a prophet, uh, spoke God's word. 
Also Aaron, who was Moses' brother and later became the first high priest who would offer the, the daily offering in the temple, the, the incense that would rise up to God and in the tabernacle and then which was later established in the temple. Miriam was also another wonderful example of God's faithfulness to his people. She was Moses' elder sister and believed to be the sister who organized with Pharaoh's daughter to be nursed by Moses' real mother. She's also a prophet and led the Israelite women in dance and song after being delivered through the reed of seeds. Sorry, the Sea of Reeds in the book of Exodus. Like most other leaders in the Old Testament, she too was flawed. Numbers 12 tells us about the way that she rose up with Aaron against Moses to usurp his leadership. God punished her along with Aaron. She was struck with leprosy, yet Moses interceded for her and cried out for her healing. And she was shown grace. She was restored. And here she's being honoured in Micah's memory, in God's memory. God also provided protection for his people. In verse 5, my, my people remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what uh, Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Now that's referring to an episode where on their journey into the promised land, the Israelites were, uh, well, one of the foreign kings, King, Mo king uh, Balak of Moab, he hired Balaam to curse Israel three times. But on each instance, God turned this pagan prophet's speech into a blessing of God's people. They were blessed. The nations couldn't hurt them. And then in the second half of verse 5, remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. I think this is meant to remind them of the, the way that God generously provided for his people on their wilderness journey to bring them into the land. These are the righteous acts of the Lord. His right actions, his great actions, his good actions. They're his acts of salvation and deliverance. Israel in this court case is to remember, effectively, remember their gospel, their salvation story. But they'd forgotten the gospel. They'd forgotten all that God had done for them. They think that God had burdened them. When he'd done so much to save them, they'd forgotten. They are yawning when they should be shouting praise for all that God has done. Now, Moses himself had anticipated this forgetfulness way back in his sermon as on the plains of Moab, just before the people go into the promised land, Moses preached, uh, Deuteronomy is effectively his sermon to the people at the end of his life. He says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you didn't build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you didn't provide, wells you did not dig, vineyards and olive groves you did not plant, when you are eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now in Micah's day, that's exactly what had happened. They'd forgotten the Lord. They'd forgotten that their worship was to be in response to God's great salvation. We see the same in the New Testament, don't we? Worship is in response to what God has done. Romans 12 verse 1. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. It's in response to the gospel. But Israel's forgotten the gospel. They've forgotten all that God's done. Little wonder their worship is all out of whack. Now, in verses 6 and 7, Micah conveys the words, the people's words, I think, in a way that's Ironic, if not sarcastic. This is the way that they're thinking that they can please God. Verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord? With what shall I bow down and worship before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body 
for the sin of my soul. See, the people don't understand worship. They think they can please God by just multiplying their sacrifices. However, the suggestion that they offer really shows they don't even understand what God had said in his law. Burnt offerings were appropriate, but year-old calves were only ever prescribed for the anointing of Aaron, the first high priest. Rams could be offered as sacrifices, but olive oil is never listed as an offering on its own. Furthermore, pouring 10,000 rivers of olive oil on the altar is crazy. If you did that on your barbecue at home, <laughs> I think you'd be getting a visit from more than the fire brigade. I think ASIO would be knocking, thinking you were up to some kind of terrorist activity. 10,000 rivers of olive oil. But then there's something even more outrageous. Can you impress God with the costliest of sacrifices? The sacrifice of your firstborn? Now, the Israelites knew, should have known that that's outrageous. God condemns child sacrifice. It's one of the detestable practices of the nations around about. Israel's to have nothing to do with that. And yet, in Micah's day, two kings tells us that their king Ahaz sacrificed his son. King Ahaz is mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1 of Micah. Micah seems to be indirectly criticizing what their king has done at this point. Outrageous. No, God's not impressed by multiplying sacrifices. Indeed, sacrifices without the love of God and the love of neighbor are offensive to God. And it's in this context then we come to what's probably the most well-known verse of Micah, Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I want to spend a moment just unpacking this verse because it's so rich. There's so much going on here. Firstly, to act justly. We often think of justice today as what happens in a court of law, don't we? And justice in the Old Testament certainly included that. Justice was at the city gates with the elders and the priests at the temple. But justice fundamentally is about acting rightly in all your relationships, just like God. Justice is frequently paired in the Old Testament with righteousness. Justice and righteousness go together and comprise what is the ethical ideal for God's people. It's living according to his ways with relationships working well. Justice in court is like a hard justice where you, know, you follow the magistrate, what they determine is the right course of action. And as I said, that's part of what justice is in the Old Testament. But justice, biblical justice also has a soft side as well. In the Old Testament and in the Bible, uh, biblical justice includes care for the needy, looking after the poor and the vulnerable in society. It's putting things right, putting things right where there's a wrong that's been committed. And that relates to the second requirement, I think, as well. To act justly but to love mercy, as the NIV has it. Mercy translates a Hebrew word. You may have heard this if you've been around Christian circles for a while, but it's a wonderful word. It's the Hebrew word chesed. Can you hear that? Chesed. You've got to not be too close to someone when you say that, just in case. Uh, but this is a wonderful word. But I think traditionally it's been understood uh, to be a covenant term, something like, it's often translated something like steadfast love or faithfulness or commitment or loyalty. There's aspects of that, but I don't think that really captures the sense of what chesed is. And some scholars have challenged this traditional understanding more recently, which I think is right. I think it's better understood as helping someone who's in danger, either a real danger or they feel like they're in danger. I think a better translation of chesed is uh, kindness or mercy, as we have here in the NIV. It's an attitude, but it's also an action. Kindness or mercy that helps someone in danger or in need. Often in the Old Testament, people so show chesed outside of 
a covenant relationship. For instance, an example is when Joseph is in prison. He asks the cupbearer, who's been imprisoned as well, that when the cupbearer is released, he asks that he might be shown an act of chesed. He doesn't have a covenant relationship with the cupbearer, but what he's, he, Joseph's in, in danger, isn't he? He's in danger of being forgotten and just rotting away in prison. He wants the cupbearer to remember him to the king so that he might be saved out of his danger. The book of Ruth. Ruth is a marvellous example of chesed. Uh, but Boaz provides for Ruth when she comes back and Naomi in the, her need. Boaz doesn't have a covenant relationship with Ruth. Well, not in the first part of the book. That's where the book ends, doesn't it? With their marriage, which is a covenant. But early on, Boaz shows chesed to Ruth as he provides for her in her danger. She's she's uh, at risk of starvation and Boaz provides. She's at risk from the, the men that might take advantage of her and Boaz provides protection. He's showing her chesed. God shows us chesed when he saves us from the danger we're in because of our sins. He forgives so that relationship can be restored. That's on the note, actually the note on which Micah finishes, which we'll see tonight at the end of chapter 7. God's chesed. But here, God calls on his people to love chesed, to love mercy, to love kindness. It's an attitude that shows itself in the way that they treat others. Doing something for those in need or in danger. And then we come to the third requirement, to walk humbly with your God. This is the only time that expression appears in the Old Testament. It seems to be a variation on an expression that is very common in the Old Testament, and that is to walk in the ways of the Lord. And in Deuteronomy, that idea is that life is like a journey, and we walk on that journey uh, in obedience to God and his requirements for us, according to his commands. Now, back in chapter 4, uh, yeah, we saw, that's right, whoop, I keep pressing the wrong one. Here we go, Micah 4. Uh, Many nations will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. Why? So that we may walk in his paths. And then in verse 5, all the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God. See how walking in the name of the Lord is this idea of obedience to the Lord's requirements. Uh, now there's a contrast to that as well. Uh, here's a few places where this contrast appears in the book of Micah. Uh, back in chapter 2 verse 3, Micah speaks of the land thieves who walk, not in the ways of the Lord, but they walk proudly. And in Micah chapter 2 verse 11, it describes those who, if a liar and a deceiver comes and says, which is literally, if someone walking with wind and deception, so it's walking wind and deception, it's deceitfulness, if they say, I'll prophesy, prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, that would be just the prophet for these people. You know, they're saying it's better to be drunk than worry about the judgment day. Plenty of wine and beer, eat, eat drink and be merry. There's no judgment day. See, they're, 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 they're off, uh, offering a false consolation. But walking wind and deception. At the end of chapter 6, those who observe the statutes of the wicked kings of Israel, Omri and Ahab, I said to be, you've observed the statutes of Omri, all the practices of Ahab's house. The NIV says you've followed their traditions, but literally it's you have walked in their policies. You've walked in the ways of these wicked kings, walked in their paths. Their policies are wicked. And I think all of that background in Micah informs us of our understanding of the walking that God requires is walking not proudly, but humbly. Walking in his ways, walking to his according to his words, not living by lies and deception, not living according to the policies of the corrupt kings. And I think this is so important for us today because 
For many, the call for social justice is often interpreted according to people's politics, according to their own ways, according to their own wind and deception. Those on the left with Marxist tendencies tend to define their policies in terms of equality of outcome. Those on the right with libertarian tendencies tend to define it in terms of equality of opportunity. The uh, Social justice then, in a sense, has become like a wax nose. You kind of shape it to fit your politics. Whatever you want is so the social justice. Uh, Old Testament scholar Hugh Williamson, Professor Hugh Williamson has captured this sense when he says, um, the call for social justice has become pervasive in 21st century world, in the 21st century world. Indeed, it's reached the point where the word seems to be emptied of any real meaning. It's invoked by people on all sides of every argument to justify their position, regardless of the merits of their case or the means that they use to arrive at their goals. It's virtually become a legitimizing cover for getting what I want. You know, you kind of clothe what you want in some Christian language and the idea of social justice actually is a Christian idea. Uh, well, it's not... Social justice is a term that was uh, popularised in Catholic theology, actually, and then brought into Protestant evangelicalism in the last century. Uh, but this idea of social justice is call for justice. We can shape it however we want, according to our politics in today's world. Social justice warriors out fighting the latest cause. But I'd like to suggest that justice that's not defined by God's word is no justice at all. A current example is the, the same-sex marriage debate, isn't it? Some would use passages like Micah 6.8 to argue that marriage is a social justice issue and that we don't have God's heart for justice if churches refuse to practice same-sex marriage. We're oppressing a minority. We're not showing love is what people argue. It's, it's unjust. It's not socially just. But I think that's misusing Micah 6.8. What we see in Micah 6.8, it's set in the context of God's salvation story and the deal that he made with his people at Mount Sinai. Doing justice is an outworking of a relationship with him that involves being taught his ways and walking in his paths established in his words and his instruction for marriage is that it's one man and one woman for life now of course christians we're to be compassionate we're to be gracious to all especially with those with whom we disagree there's no place for self-righteousness in the christian walk but if we say we want justice and yet reject the instruction the clear instructions of the bible We've turned justice into just getting what I want. And it will not result in justice at all. But in Micah's day, the issues of injustice that we see he was wrestling with and fighting against were corrupt business practices, violence and lies. Verse 10, Am I to forget your ill-gotten treasures, your wicked house, the short ephah, which is accursed, an ephah was a unit of measure. You know, you turn up to the to Woolies and you measure your your um, your groceries on the scales, your fruit and veg, but they've rigged the scales, so you end up paying more. Well, I'm not saying that that's what Woolies have done, but uh, you know, the idea, if, if weights and measures, if you're not getting what you thought you'd buy, bought, you're being ripped off. Um, they were filling up in the, in Micah's day. They were filling up the basket of wheat with all of the Offcuts, the grain, and the, sorry, not the grain, but the, the husks and the, the, the extra leaves and other things. So it was filling it out, but you weren't getting what you'd paid for. And that same thing can happen in business today, can't it? People give quotes for what they're going to do on your house and then use how they're going to build your house and then use different materials, inferior materials that aren't what you've paid for, aren't what you were told. That's, that kind of practice is, is to be completely anathema for the Christian. We keep our word. We do what we say we will do. We keep our word, our honour. That's one of the practices that we see here. And uh, verse 11 makes it clear. Shall I acquit someone with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? You rich people are violent. 
Your inhabitants are liars. Uh, their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore, I've begun to destroy you. See, these, these practices that are happening here are really the sins of the city. Cities are about wealth and pride and hubris. Uh, there's so many examples today, aren't there? I've talked about the building industry, but even well-intentioned programs like the NDIS. The NDIS is great. It's been set up to support the vulnerable in our society. And yet, it's being ripped off, isn't it, by greedy and, and dishonest providers. The cost of fraud in the NDIS is thought to be in the billions. The government is spelling, spending millions of dollars to detect this fraud. I think it's something like 80 million was allocated this year in the budget for detecting NDIS fraud. That's a lot of money, isn't it? That's just the fraud because how do you address this? We look for political solutions, don't we? But the problem with politics on the left and the right is that neither side can solve the problem of human sin. I mean, they can set up restraints and try to catch people out but how do you change the heart so that people want to do what's right and want to love their neighbor the marxist dream of fixing the structures of society to create utopia will never work because it doesn't account for human sin but then neither does the capitalist free market dream either which seems to just feed greed and insane ceo salaries now, private ownership of property and capitalism does seem to lift most people out of poverty in human history, but it needs to be have some kind of constraint on it so that people can't just get away with murder, so to speak. But God's solution actually isn't found in politics, left or right. Actually, God wants us to look up, doesn't he? Not sideways, to look up to him as the one who as the exalted one came down to serve us and gave his life as a ransom for many, to save us from the danger that we are in, to show chesed, mercy to us. And just as Micah called the Israelites to remember the gospel, so we too are to remember the gospel of Jesus that turns lives upside down no actually it turns them up the right way doesn't it god's kindness in christ is what transforms us to treat others with chesed with mercy to act in the interests of others rather than ourselves now i think it's worth pointing out here that mike is not preaching to the nations he's actually preaching to god's people Evangelicals are good, for, are good at uh, calling for non-believers to act justly and often the issues that we highlight reflect our politics. There's no shortage of issues we can call out our society for, are there? Gambling, drinking, treatment of refugees, abortion, the environment. Where do we stop? Where do we begin? Well, I think we need to begin with our own lives, our own families, our own churches, our own Christian institutions, if we run businesses, our own businesses, the way that we operate. Peter says, live such good lives amongst the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. Social justice begins with us and the way that we treat one another. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great word of challenge, but also encouragement for the way the gospel turns things right side up. Father, help us not to feel burdened by following you, but to rejoice in your mercy. Father, we pray that this mercy that we've experienced, if we haven't experienced that today, help us to, to cry out to you 
for salvation for the danger from the danger that we're in but those of us who know that salvation help us to live it out in our day-to-day lives in all the relationships that we're in we need your spirit to lead us in that to empower us in that and so we pray that you will work in us to show in our lives the great mercy that you've shown us in the way that we treat others for Jesus' sake. Amen.